Entry 4, A Trail of Whispers It didn't take long for Archie to come to his senses. He knew exactly what we had to do. We had to find out who was all behind this and what was really going on. I suggested that the best place to start would be the woods between Oakwood and Abilakin. It was decided that Archie's home, although it was a dump, would be our base, since I figured nobody would have eyes on it, at least for a while that is. We would reconvene here every night and talk over anything that we'd found and discuss our next steps. Something else occurred to me while we spoke that first night. I never made it to the second clearing in the woods, the night that I went for my walk. This particular clearing is just north of the spider, but there had always been something so unusual about it, but I couldn't put my finger on it. 57.222924 minus 3.818597, that's the coordinates for the area. If you happen to look it up, you'll notice that it's unusually green, so bright in fact that nowhere within miles is actually that green. Additionally, there's always a sense of being watched, though not in a sinister way. It's as if you're being held and you're safe, like you're, like you're guarded from all around in a bubble. Anyway, as this all began in those woods, I decided that it was probably where we were going to go first, to see if we could find anything at all. That very night, after I got Archie a good meal and made him rest up, we would head up to Oakwood to investigate. There was no time to waste. I drove his beat up old Nissan to the camping ground. We sat at the entrance while I described to him what the plan was. Put simply, we would head straight along the trail until we were pretty much in line with the clearing, then head directly through the woods quietly and avoiding being detected by anything that made us feel uneasy, such as noises or weird men casually walking alone. Basically, keep our eyes on the prize, I said. It was 1 a.m. exactly when we exited the vehicle and made our way through the gate to Oakwood, heading straight for the trail at the top. There were no voices from the campground this time. As we reached the trail, I started getting goosebumps all over my arms, remembering everything that had happened a little over a week ago. It felt like I had forgotten, like it was a distant memory that had all come rushing back to haunt me. It made me weak in the knees, just thinking about what could possibly lie ahead. I took a look above me. The moon was full that night, and bright as ever. The sky was clear, and the familiar stars and constellations twinkled in delight at my return. I looked at Archie, who didn't seem half as phased as I did. We're going for it then, I asked, nodding my head. Fucking right we are, he replied, nodding back to me. We sat off along the trail. The wind brushed the treetops on either side to break the quiet. I felt uneasy expecting to see someone appear from the distance or from the tree line at any second. Archie marched beside me with purpose in his step. I'm not sure he believed me when I told him what happened the last time I was here. I didn't mind, though. His confidence gave me a boost, if anything. We had walked around for about ten minutes or so, through the trail, and were approaching the bend. What lie ahead? I dreaded to think. I began to feel the hairs on my neck prick up as a vile icy wind came from behind and slapped us with cold. I pulled my collar up and shivered. My breath was now visible in the air. As we hit the turning point, I heard something. I could feel those familiar eyes piercing me at every angle, but I made sure not to look anywhere but straight ahead. I heard it again. Welcome. It sounded like in a soft, slow whisper. Then, welcome back. 
This was a little bit more clearer, but sounded like multiple whispers all around us. I stared straight ahead. I could now see the final straight of the trail leading to the lake. I turned to Archie. His confident demeanor had faded rapidly, and he looked like he was ready to turn back. We've come this far, Archie. It'll be okay, I reassured him, although I'm not sure he was quite convinced. I saw his jaw drop as he looked ahead and to the left. I looked up. About 40 or 50 feet away, a head was peeking out from behind a tree, with wide dark eyes and white as a sheet. The face was grinning and motionless. A soft mist fell upon us, and then the head was gone. What way is this clearing bit we're going to, left or right? Archie asked, his voice shaking and full of uncertainty. It's left, I replied. Right. Fuck this Blair Witch shit. I'm going back to the car. I'm not going in there, Archie said, already turning on his heels. I quickly grabbed his arm. Archie, don't worry. If anything happens, we stick together. If you run back alone, what do you think is going to be waiting for you around that corner? I said. Archie then sighed. Well, we should both go back then and come back during the day. This shit is fucked up, he said. I grabbed both his arms and said, Listen, Archie, we are never going to find anyone here during the day, except for tourists and idiots. We're here to find out what's going on at night. If shit hits the fan, then we run. But we run together, and we stick together no matter what, I said. Archie gave another big sigh. Right. Fuck. Okay, let's do it then, and hurry up, he replied. I turned back toward the lake. The mist was getting a little thicker now. We couldn't see too far ahead of ourselves. We both stopped in our tracks for a moment to listen, as we heard more whispers coming from our fronts and to the left. It was mostly unintelligible, like a crowd of people whispering different words all at once. The fog rolled from right to left and got progressively thicker. I heard torqued ropes swinging slowly from the branches as the whispering got more frequent. Our pace had slowed and suddenly we came to a halt. In the fog, not far ahead of us, were seven figures standing in a line black as coal and tall with hooded robes. They stared at us as we stared back at them. Slowly, one by one, they all moved to the tree line like they were floating or gliding. I never saw any movement from their legs. My heart was pounding out of my chest. We were almost at the point where we should head into the woods, but I decided that we should go in now, get through to the green clearing fast, and avoid getting any closer to those figures in the fog. The whispering became louder and seemed more aggressive. The fog became thicker at that point. I thought I saw some bodies hanging from the trees, so we adjusted our path accordingly, making sure to stay away from them. Sometimes the whispers seemed to twirl around us like a tornado of hate, and when we changed direction slightly, they would come from only a certain way, as if they were leading us to where we had to be. Before I even realized what we were doing, we were literally following the whispers, just like Joe had told me to do. A dim yellow and orange glow made ourselves visible as we approached the clearing. Still through thick wood, but flickers of its light danced past us every few steps. It grew brighter as we got closer. I already knew, but I confirmed it to myself anyway, that that was a fire. I heard laughing and whispering mantras from beyond the three or four layers of trees that separated us from the green grass. There were several hooded figures standing in a line as two others walked back and forth, making signs with their hands and making everyone drink from a large bowl or chalice type thing. It seemed like there was absolutely no fog here. 
We looked all around and saw absolutely nothing, beyond about two trees in every direction. But looking into the clearing, we could see everything as clear as day. I felt a soft hand caress the back of my head. I flinched and found nothing behind me. I was so close to screaming at this point, but I knew I couldn't give away our position. We inched forward. Still the whispering went on, and the fire raged. One of the hooded men was making hand gestures as if he was controlling the fire. It waltzed about ten feet high before him. Every now and then, he would throw something into the fire that would make it burst into a ball of flame and light up the whole area. During one of these bursts, I noticed that there were more hooded people watching from the tree line behind them. Another burst, I saw more, to the left and the right. Another and another. Every time it happened, I saw more and more of them all around the clearing, watching from the shadows. And I felt ice on my neck. My eyes started to go hazy as I felt those grotesque long fingers snake around my neck. And I heard a slow, deep gargling growl, like a beast stalking its prey. And I tried my best to keep my eyes open and make out the face of any person in the robes before me. And I looked at Archie. There was a glowing white visage with sharp pointed grinning teeth standing nose to nose with him. He smiled a huge grin in return. His eyes rolled back in his head as he fell to the ground and began to seize. The last thing I saw was foam pouring from in between Archie's larger than normal teeth as he smiled and smiled and shook all over the place, grinning with increasing intensity. The last thing I felt was the grip around my neck tightening. Then it felt like I was being cradled to sleep. My eyes began to roll back in my head. I was suddenly in a dark room, bound to a wooden chair. The rope around my wrist burned my skin. A single black candle cast a faint glow. There were seven hooded figures lined up in front of me. One was waving some kind of incense that smelled like putrid shit. They all began to approach me. I tried to scream. I tried to vigorously free my hands. It felt like I was about to have a heart attack. Then I woke up. Beads of morning dew scurried down my face. and I had no idea what the hell happened. I was lying in the damp grass in the center of the clearing. And Archie was gone. And I got to my feet. My body ached incredibly as I tried my best to move myself around to see if there was anything or anyone in sight. There was nothing, no people, no fire, and no evidence that there was ever anyone there just hours ago. The only thing I did notice were very small polished looking rounded stones near the north side of the clearing. They were arranged in two V-shapes and a circle. Apart from that, there was nothing, not even a sign of fire. I sat on a stump for a minute or so. I needed strength in my legs. I didn't even know what time it was. I started heading back to the trail, then to Oakwood. I assumed that Archie bolted and took the car. But when I got the entrance in my sight, the car was still there. There were people standing around it. One of them looked familiar. As I got closer, my worst fear was realized. Williams stood by the car, smiling as he watched me walking toward it. New car there, Cameron? He smiled as he asked, knowing full well that it wasn't my car. Apparently, the owners phoned the police about the car blocking the entrance. Now... Why a detective chief superintendent would have responded to that call would be beyond most people. But I knew exactly why he was there. It's not my car, actually, I replied, shaking my head. Well, we'll get this car towed then, buddy. See who picks it up.
he said, still smiling. In the meantime, why don't you hop in my car? I think we should take a drive. I have an update on Julian's case, he said. I agreed without a word. I just climbed in his car, happy to feel the soft leather seat. I sat with my head in my hands as Williams got in next to me. He turned and stared at me for longer than felt comfortable. I could see him in my periphery, but I didn't respond. He then gave out a chuckle and started the engine. It purred loud as we pulled out of the camp entrance. So, Cameron, he started. I already felt sick at the possibilities of what was to come. He continued. What was all that about? He asked. Spending the night in some woods, creeping around a campsite? He said. I lifted my head and looked straight forward, noticing that he wasn't driving toward the town. I was looking for Julian. I must have passed out or something. I haven't been sleeping well, I answered. Williams then looked at me again. His massive form seemed almost too big for the car. He gave me the fear. Oh, he exclaimed. Well, that's good to see. Such dedication, he said. I looked at him for the first time. He was still smiling. Uh, where, where are we going? I asked nervously. Just taking in a little scenery to calm ourselves down a bit. It's been a long night for both of us, William said, his eyes darting between me and the road. He then slowed the car almost to a halt, then took a cut off the road into some trees a few miles north from where I could tell. He pulled the car over into the middle of the trees. Get out, he said. His voice had changed, and now the fake smile became a very real frown. I quickly did as I was told. Williams got out after me. He came up to me and stood in my face. Now, Cameron, he began in a low yet aggressive voice. I specifically told you to keep your mouth shut, he hissed, spit flying from his mouth. A rage that seemed to come out of nowhere. I, I've kept my mouth shut, I said, speaking back like a disobedient child. I, I haven't said a word, not to anyone, I said. Is that so? He replied. Then what the fuck were you and that junkie Archie doing in the woods? I knew that was his car. What are you talking about? I don't know why his car was there. I was just looking for Julian. That's all, I said, lying unconvincingly. Sure, okay, but the thing is, I know you're full of shit, Cameron. I saw you both, and you saw far too much, he snarled, his voice growling in anger. He then punched me in the gut. It felt as though my ribs had wrapped all the way around his fist. I dropped to the ground, struggling to breathe. What, what did you do with Archie? I managed to push out between deep, labored breaths. I don't know where he is. Probably away buying some heroin, the fucking scumbag, he said, after circling my whimpering body as I knelt there on the ground. But when I find him, he's a fucking dead man. He's already had his last chance, and now I'm giving you yours. He then brought his fist down and hammered the back of my neck. This is the last time I'm going to tell you this. Keep your fucking mouth shut and don't go looking in places that you have no business being, Cameron, he said. He turned, took a step toward his car, and opened the driver's side door. Cameron, he yelled as he sat inside. I looked up at him, defeated in body and mind. I almost forgot. If you want to see your son alive... Do not fucking cross me ever again, he said. He then slammed the door and sped off, leaving me broken on the marshy soil. I wanted to scream at him. I wanted to get up and kill him, but I had absolutely no fight left in me. I lied there, 
sobbing for the longest time. I didn't know what I could do next, if anything at all. 